thank you all. It's been fantastic getting to see your games. Mm -hmm. It's so exciting to come out here and see all of you uh, who are going to get to do all the things that I never did and that my generation never did with games. Um, so that's fantastic. And I've, I've spent the last, God, it's been 10 years of my life now working on games. I've worked on things ranging from the Call of Duty series to Farmville to League of Legends. I teach when I can, and of course I write extra credits. And in coming here, I thought a lot about what speech I wanted to give and what I wanted to address specifically to you guys. Because this is very different than talking to a lot of the AAA companies and that sort of thing I talk to all the time. And I realized, that first I was going to give you guys an esoteric speech on design. But then I realized there's something else I have to do. There's something that's far more important. And it's this idea that games are more than a pastime. That we owe something through this art. We owe something to give back. Uh, that games are more than a way to pass the hours between work and sleep. They're more than a way to just get through the day. Uh, I was talking recently to people who advised the president, and they asked me, why should I care about games? Why should someone like the president of the United States care about video games? And this caused me to think a lot, right? Because, as you all know, we're the fastest growing medium in history, right? In 20 years, we eclipsed the box office. The amount of hours that people spend on uh, this medium is just mind-boggling. Uh, not only do we all have experience from this, but every great monument that humanity has ever made could be built in one year in the time that people spend playing Microsoft Solitaire. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and yet, there's a reason, right? There's a reason that we all gravitate to this. Uh, there's, there's something there that magic about games that's different, right? Because there's a reason that we're all here on a Saturday. There's lots of things you could be doing. For a lot of you, this is your one day off. For many of you, you have slaved hundreds of hours to build a game to show here. And I mean, this is, this is what got me thinking because I tried. I tried to ask this question myself. I tried to ask myself, what is the magic of games? And I tried to deconstruct it like I do on extra credits and take it apart logically and I couldn't do it. And then I had to ask myself, okay, then what leads me to right here, right now, right? Why with this one walk through life, why with this one chance that I got, why did I decide to dedicate my life to games? Why have many of you sitting here made the decision that your education, your life is going to be towards this medium, which so many people say is a frivolity? Um, and I, so I tried to deconstruct this, and I tried to ask myself, what is it about this medium? Because within this medium, almost all of us, I could ask any of you in this room, and I'm sure you could tell me about an experience that m moved you, an experience that mattered to you. And so I asked myself, what is that? What causes that? And so you're going to have to bear with me, because as I said, I couldn't break it down logically. So I'm going to have to go back to, I, I really did, I started going through my life, and one of my earliest memories, probably my first vivid memory, is so what leads me here? And I was traveling down, as I do, as I do the flashback thing, but uh, I was traveling through Seattle. I live in Seattle, and I was five years old at the time. And my mom was driving, we traveling south through Seattle. And Seattle's a great town for games, right? You got Valve, you got Microsoft, you got uh, PopCap, you got Wizards of the Coast, all these things. But I didn't know any of that at the time. We were driving south through the city. And we pull up next to this big, boxy, warehousey looking building next to a stadium that's not even there anymore. And I will never ever forget this moment because I have no idea what's going on. But we go up to the building, we walk through these two big glass sliding doors, and just hit by this cacophony of midi. And it was the Nintendo of America's World's Fair. It was the first one they had ever done because Nintendo's located in Seattle. And uh, there were just all these games, and here I was, I was running from game to game to game, my mom keeps going, hey, are you sure you don't want to transfer? She's going, no, I gotta see you mom. And uh, she just thinks it'd be a lark, right? She bought me a Nintendo for Christmas, she knows I like this stuff. But as I'm racing along, I'm racing along, finally, I get to this little, little station at the very back of the auditorium, and there's this banner 
with this sword and axe crossed by a crystal ball with a city in the center of it. And something about that image spoke to my five-year-old self. I knew, I knew I had to play it. And at the time, we were terrible, terrible at conventions. All we do is we just set up two machines and let people play for as long as they wanted. So we're standing in this line. We're probably standing in this line for 45 minutes. And I'm the only child in this line. Uh, granted, everybody else is probably 14, but I thought they were adults at the time. Uh, and my mom keeps on, are you sure you want to play this one? Look at me, the others. There's some other open ones. Uh, and I go, no, like, this is what I have to play. And finally, finally I get up there. I put my hands on this gray piece of plastic, and it's like my characters. A lot of you know what game this is. And this is the first time I'd ever played anything like this, right? I'd never experienced anything even remotely like this in my life. And I'm playing this game, and I'm loving it, it's awesome. And I'm playing through this, and it probably takes me an hour to beat Garland. And it's for any of you who still remember that game, right? The first boss, you probably blazed through in like 15 minutes now. But at the time, I was super excited because I had beaten the game. I mean, I had played video games before. I knew what you did in video games. You rescued princesses, and I rescued the princess, so I had beaten the game. Um, and I was really excited to see the ending of this game. Great, I'm gonna go back to the castle, I'm gonna bring back the princess, and they're gonna show me the end, and man, that was a good time. And I get back, I walk back to this castle, and they say to me, thank you for rescuing our princess, we'll fix this bridge for you. And I'm like, that's a weird way to end a game. <laughs> And so I get up to the bridge, and you all know what happens, right? The music just starts to swell, and you get this screen, and this may not look like anything to you right now, but at the time, this was gorgeous. And the text just starts to scroll, and it tells you, it told me who I was before. It made me feel powerful, it made me feel like a hero, right? It showed me my place in that world. And that was an incredibly thing. That was an incredibly powerful moment for me. You want to know something? That's not why I'm here. I'm mean, here's the next one. Because after this, after the screen, when this fades to black, afterwards, a world opens up in front of you. Think about what that means to someone who's five. Think about what that means to someone whose entire world is maybe a couple of rooms in the backyard, unsupervised. And here, there's this entire planet for me to explore, continents for me to discover. That was it was an incredible thing. It freed me in a way I had never been before. That was a powerful moment for me. And it's not only that day, right? You've all had this experience. You've all had this moment where you turn on that screen and you lose yourself in one of these worlds. And before, you may feel trapped in your major or your job or other things. And you sit down and there's this world just for you. And as you play through, and you turn off that screen an hour or two later, after that experience, you take some of that with you, right? You, you feel a little bit more free because you realize that this world is just like that one, right? This is a whole world for you to explore. The choices that you have here are just like the choices that you have there. And that's an incredible thing, right? That's something that no other meaning can give us. There's no other place where we have that sense of freedom, that sense of exploration, that sense of a world for us. And so to me, that, this freedom to explore, to discover, to inquire, that's something you need to gain, so that's part of the magic of games. But there's a lot more than that, right? Because since then, I've set foot on a thousand worlds, I've seen 10,000 sunsets, I've lived history and walked on the streets of ancient cities, I've seen things I couldn't possibly imagine, and experienced things I couldn't even dream of. Sometimes, just sat back and enjoyed the view. Uh, and so this world is an important part. But more than that, you know what games let us do? Games let us just this little bit experience a life we would otherwise never get to live. Become someone else and step into someone else's shoes and for a moment, just for a tiny bit, know what it is to be them. And through doing so, come with sympathy and empathy, compassion and understanding. Or, or maybe, maybe they just get to get it, to allow us to live a little bit of that life we thought we wanted. And they put us in the shoes of the greatest people and make us face their struggles and wrestle with their challenges. And through doing so, 
come to better understand who we are. <coughs> That's a powerful thing. That's something that no other medium can do. No television, no film, no book can let you walk a mile in someone else's shoes and come to know a life that you will never lead. That's a powerful thing. But somewhere, somewhere in chasing after this, we lost some of the magic that comes with stuff like this. Somewhere in trying to be more like other media, in trying to be more like film or television, uh, we lose track at times of what's powerful, what's unique about our media. And the truth is that we have something that's never been seen before. Never in human history have we had a mass meeting where our audience is not merely <coughs> but participatory. In a game, you don't just sit back and listen to me tell you my ideas. You don't just listen to an author or a director tell you what they're thinking about. No. In a game, you make your own choices. You make your own decisions. You tell yourself your own story. And through doing so, come to find out more of who you are. As a designer, I don't build a game. I build a space of possibility. I set the boundaries, but that's all I do. My work is incomplete without you. You are as much the artist here as I am. My stories go unwritten without you, the player. That's something that no other medium can give us. And through these play, through these choices we make, through these moments where we have to face ourselves in games, we come to learn so much about ourselves. And I'm not just talking about those big moral choice moments. I'm not just talking about that moment where you have to choose between good and evil. I'm talking about any moment in a game where you sit down and you just put the controller down in front of you and say, what did I just do? What did I just do? That's something that no other medium can let you do. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the question is, because we can address anything. It doesn't matter if it's a question of the remote horrors of modern war, or if we're asking what it means to raise a gun to your shoulder and point it at another man. It doesn't matter if it's a simpler thing. What makes this life worth going through? Who do we want to share it with? What it means to go from one side to the other. We're not limited by the genres we understand. We're not limited by the ideas we've already explored. Very often, people will tell you that games are simply about fun. But this is false. Games are about engagement. Games are about this gripping moment where we wrestle with everything from the joy of physicality to the deepest questions about our very being, about the human experience. And so we're not limited by just this exploration of violence. Not that those questions are invalid, not that we shouldn't ask those questions, but as you, as creators, move forward in your careers, as you go to build, know that like any other media, there's no part of this human experience that we can't address. Even if it's just the simple question of what it means that you can never go back. And that's part of the magic of game. But there's one other thing that I really wanted to talk about, about the magic of games, before I sort of open up the floor and turn this into a discussion, because our meetings interact, and so too should these things be. Uh, but it's this idea that through games we can educate without teaching. <coughs> How many of you guys recognize this? <laughs> All right, yeah, good, good, that's what I thought. I'm glad most of you are willing to pass up to it too. Right? <laughs> uh, so it's a frozen shape, it's a magic card. And as a young man, I was very lost. I was interested. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, much less where I wanted to go to college. And this card actually determined where I went to college. Because <laughs> one day, we, we laugh, right? We laugh because it seems like such a simple thing because we've been trained to laugh at the idea of games having that much of an impact, right? But if I told you this book, right? If I said that this book determined where I went to college, we'd be like, yeah, of course. Makes sense, you really learned something from that. Um, 
And yet, really, what I learned from this card was about books. Uh, and you can probably read on the bottom, right? It says, there are some qualities, some incorporate things, which have a double life which thus is made, a type of twin entity which springs from matter and light, evinced of solid and shade. Edgar Allan Poe, silence. This is the first time I'd ever heard language like that. Up until that moment, I had uh, simply read my hack fantasy and sci-fi, which is great, which I still love to this day. But you know what I did after, after seeing that card? I remember opening that card, just reading it. And then I ran out to the library. And I got the book that quote was written. Mm -hmm. And then I got every book that they quote in Magic the Gathering. Right. But you know what it left me with? It left me with a lifelong love of classics. I went and got my major in classics at a university where you do nothing but read all day, every day. You start in Homer, and you end up in Einstein, and you read every subject, and that's the school. And I went because Richard spent a few extra minutes at the end of a long day putting something of worth into his game. And it didn't take away anything from the game, right? All the time we were, we were concerned that, oh, if we add ed elements of value to our game, it'll no longer be fun. But these moments, these moments ahead of the back to that game, these moments, uh, these quotes, they had another layer that was even more engaging. We don't lose anything by that. And uh, I have a master's in entertainment technology. I don't use it anywhere near as much as I use the education and the lifelong level of classics, both in my personal life and my work life, that these cards instilled in me. And so, as we're going, as we're building our games, we owe it to find the small moments those tiny places where games can be better for being better. But it's not, it's tiny stuff like that, right? Um, how many of you guys recognize this? Yeah, all right, we got enough programmers in this room. Uh, all right, so this is the stack, right? This is how memory management works in a computer. But I remember the first time I was on the job and I was learning how to script, right? I was a designer down to Activision and they, ha, I knew some scripting, but I wasn't particularly good. Um, and I was talking with one of my engineers, and he starts explaining this to me. I'm like, I got it, right? Because I had been using this system for a decade. This is exactly how magic works, last in, first out, right? And I was actually better at thinking around problems involving this than a lot of the guys have been using this for five, six years. Because why? I had learned it in a context where I, I cared about it. It wasn't just for a job, and it's silly, right? But I cared more about my ability in the game and many people cared about learning this for their job. And that was true. I found that true over and over again, right? Uh, and so there's nothing we can't teach through this system. It runs the gamut of ideas. But as many of you know, um, I have been working with the US public school system, and actually school systems around the world, a, uh, a fair amount over the last two years. And What's amazing to me is that games, games present an answer to so many of the problems that we're trying to solve. When I go into these classrooms, I find that uh, we're wrestling with the fact that our school system, our educational system, it isn't broken. It's actually the best it's ever been at doing what it was designed to do. But it was designed to move an agrarian society to an industrial society. It wasn't designed to move our industrial society into its information age future. It was designed for a time when uh, there weren't a lot of libraries or access to information, when you had to memorize your multiplication tables because who knows when you went back to your village if you were going to be able to look that up ever. It was designed to make better clerks and factory workers. And that has value, but that's not what we're doing today. Today, schools are no longer just warehouses of knowledge. Today, in the palms of our hands, on our cell phones, on the internet, and Wikipedia, we have access to more raw data than at all the aggregated libraries of the 19th century. And you know what? You know what games do? Games don't ask you to memorize. They don't ask you to uh, simply retain data, because that's not the future. The future isn't about retaining data. It's about using it. What do games do? Games present you with a set of data and say, solve problems 
with this set of data. <coughs> and that's what education needs to do. I hear this over and over again. Uh, the government, a couple years back, did this massive study. They went to universities and they went to major corporations all around the world. And they asked, they asked, what do our students need to be effective in the 21st century? And they got back four things. They got back uh, lateral thinking, teamwork, communication, and logical problem solving. Oh, and creativity was the, was the fifth one, which we're still arguing about whether or not we can teach. But I think we can. And the truth is, I can't name a set of things that we practice more every day in games, right? And yet, and yet we don't find a way to, to better do it. We're afraid of uh, making the transfer from our game world to our real world. And that's a problem to solve. But really, as you're going through this, as you're talking about your games, as you're thinking through how we can make a better world for tomorrow, which I think is our responsibility as custodians of uh, a new medium in the world, realize that, like with, like with the questions we can ask ourselves, uh, teaching isn't limited. Right? Uh, I have seen high-level math taught through World of Warcraft. I have sat in a class in Berkeley where uh, economics was taught through StarCraft. I've seen, I've seen kids leaning forward rather than sit back and check out in a history class because of civilization. And I've even seen that dullest of subjects, city planning, <laughs> made engaging by what we do. Uh, so let me ask you this, right? And if you care, right? If you want, if you're talking about the traditional model, if you care about data with him, how many of you guys know 25 Pokemon? Just hands in the air. Let's go 50. 100. 150. 200. Hey, this is ridiculous. All right, put your hands down. This is awesome. Think about, think about if those were vocabulary words. Right? Think about how much data you retain, not because anybody sat you down in a chair, not because anybody gave you a test or made you do homework, but because you wanted to. That's the power of games. That's what we deliver to people all the time, every day. And finally, sometimes it's the things we don't even notice that we do that are the most important. I was working with a school in a lower income area, and this was the sort of school where I mean, one day a kid came up to me and said he couldn't do his homework because they were hiding in the bathtub because people were shooting outside. This is the sort of school where you didn't go to college, where pregnancy was just something that, that just happened. And uh, I'm talking to this kid, and I haven't played Mario. And I'm originally going to teach him about the scientific method. But I watch him, and he's playing Mario. And he runs and he jumps and he falls in the pit. And he runs and he jumps and he falls in this pit. And he runs and he jumps. He tries something different, and he gets to the other side. And in doing so, it didn't vastly open this door, but just a little bit, it kicked open the door, and we started having this conversation about the fact that that was his life, right? That as, that he had this option, that he, that some choice he could make would get him over that pit. It wouldn't necessarily be easy, but if he wanted to go to college, there was some path, some set of choices that went there. He spent most of his life only thinking about the present because that was all he could handle. And then in this game, in this silly 20-year-old game, we had this moment where he saw time compressed down and saw action and consequence put side by side. And yes, on some logical level, he had always known it, right? But on that much deeper level, this game made him understand that he had agency that his life wasn't pre-written. And that's an incredible thing. That's something that we do every day. That's what schools are supposed to do every day, right? They're supposed to empower you to find the life that you want. And this is something that we can help provide as well. And so as you're working through your games, uh, think about the fact that education, learning, is something that we're all supposed to love. And we can help, we can help give that, because that's part of the magic of games. But before I go, I do occasionally talk to these things about, to some of my colleagues. And periodically, uh, I get people looking at me and going, James, that sounds great. I absolutely love to do that. It all sounds really good, but that's insane. <laughs> <laughs> because 
We're about the bottom line. We're a business. We've got to hit our numbers, right? And yeah, I get that. I actually think that's true. But you know what I think is the same? This quote goes, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. The last couple of years, we have seen major publishers collapse. We have seen long-standing studios shutter their doors. We have even seen the great new hope that uh, <laughs> so many studios <laughs> decided to model themselves after, we have seen them start to fall apart because you can only dupe your customer for so long. And so we have to, we have to realize that our audience has changed, that our audience isn't merely 14-year-old boys any longer. And truth be told, those 14-year-old boys that are out there way savvier than I was when I was 14. Uh, and so we can't, we can't keep selling to people by saying your mom's going to hate you. We can't just address the lowest, basis parts of our nature. We can't simply pander to people anymore. Right? <laughs> and we laugh, we crack up, right? Because this, you, many of you guys know that there are parts of this ad campaign which are cut off that I cannot continue to show in this video. Um, because these guys ran the sleaziest, worst, most terrible ad campaign ever. They were like, and that's where their ad started, that was their original ad, and they over time decided, well, we know what, what's going to sell our game. But you know what's really funny? Even these guys ended up realizing because that's what their ads look like today. And the reason is, yeah, we're shocked. But there's nothing to build off of. If your game, if the way you bring people in is, is just pandering, is just uh, appealing to the lowest aspects of what it means to be human. If it, if it is just simply trying to trick people into starting this experience, you don't have anything to build off of. You don't have a franchise. You don't have things that someone will tell other people about two decades down the line. You don't have something that people voluntarily just put money into because they love, right? That's not what you got. So even these guys have learned that we've got to do better. Because uh, in a world where a game that looks like this is sold for $2 billion, right? <laughs> Vastly outsells a game that looks like this. <laughs> we gotta ask ourselves, what's some of the magic that people found here? And maybe we lost while trying to push a few more polys in something like this. And so to me, to me the magic of games is our ability to step into someone else's shoes, to experience another life, a whole other set of experiences that we could never participate in, in our real life. Um, and it's this idea that we can explore a space of possibilities, that we can tell ourselves our own stories through games and make our own decisions, and through that question, through wrestling with those decisions, come to better understand who we are. And finally, it's this ability to educate without teaching. But these are my thoughts, right? This is where this journey took me. I encourage each and every one of you, especially those of you who are planning to dedicate your life to this medium, to spend the next decade, two decades, three decades, uh, building and working on critiquing these very games. Uh, what does it mean to you? Because you may come to other answers, and I think that has value. But I think it's important that we all take this trip. Uh, and in that spirit, as I said earlier, it's far less important what I say to you here than the conversation that comes out of this moment. So I would love to hear all of your thoughts. If there are any questions, any, anything that anyone wants to throw at me, go for it. <laughs> this is so good. <laughs> By the way, in terms of importance, we won an Emmy for this. Just, just saying. Uh, so, uh, that was an Oscar, wasn't it? one of those. Was it Emmy? Was it Grammy? Was it Grammy? You won one of them. This shows you how much I care about those awards. We have to need our own at some point. But all right, now I've bought you enough time by trying to figure out what awards this one that somebody should got to have a question. All right, let's go. Um, I definitely get that games teach. And I think that games teach people about Um, like, I learned more from that from playing video than math classes. And my kind of question is, is that when you go about, I just, it, very, it seems 
So most of the teaching experiences that come from games are very accidental. And I was wondering, how do you find, if I have an assignment that I want to teach somebody a specific thing, kind of what is the way to go about it? Because a lot of those times we go about doing it aren't very fun. So this is a really good question. Um, I'm going to try and repeat the question since we don't have a mic, but the fundamental question is, a lot of the time, you look at these educational games, and they're simply the textbook with the game skin, right? They're not fun. They don't actually use the core elements of a game, and instead, some of the best moments are this accidental teaching. But I don't think that all this teaching is accidental. I actually think that, right, so take magic, which I was talking about. Richard meant that to teach math, right? He was a math teacher. That's what he did. Uh, and for all these things, it's because of how we term things. We call educational games uh, only things which are bad, right? Uh, we very rarely say civilization, yeah, totally educational game. Sim City, complete educational game. Total War game, educational game, right? Even Assassin's Creed is an educational game. And not the jumping from buildings, killing people. <laughs> but uh, I remember I did. I was in Italy, and I went down and I did. I went to all those sites, right? And I knew things about them because I had played that game. Um, and so I think, and right, those that wasn't necessary. There was no reason they had to put all that stuff into <coughs> Assassin's Creed. And so I think the answer to your question is make games that are engaging, and then figure out how you can add to that engagement by adding things of value in, rather than necessarily starting from uh, from the ground up saying, I am going to teach you this. That's what we get to do. For those of you who are trying to teach very specific subjects, the key is to find what's engaging in that subject first, right? The fact that math gave you power over Yu-Gi-Oh, right? The fact that math let you control your reality in Yu-Gi-Oh, like, that's actually what's cool about math in general, right? That's why we started math anyway, because we liked these, it was either an abstract problem, a puzzle that we wanted to solve, and it gave us interesting puzzles, or it was because we wanted to, in some way, have a better, better control of this universe, which may be totally out of our control. And it's these things, right? We dig down, we find out as designers what, where the core engagement is, not only in our mechanics, but in everything we look at. Um, and so as we're trying to do these things, this is one of the problems, I think, with education that you hit on very well. Uh, we spend too much time trying to figure out what we have to teach kids and how we should teach them it without spending enough time thinking about why they would want to learn it. And luckily in the games department, you should, you should be able to spend a lot of time asking questions of why and presenting to kids, here's the reason. Uh, but other questions, other thoughts? Yeah? Um, so, just to preface, I'm an information scientist first, not a game designer. Sure. So what you said is super interesting because you brought it to my area. Um, it's almost to my playing field. Um, a lot of the time when I talk about education with my, uh, my information professors, we talk about the value of information and semantics. Mm -hmm. And we actually have brought it to games because one of the cool things about games is it teaches you methods, not answers. Right. That is um, like one of the cool things about games. It just gives you a medium to play it. You have to find the solutions, and your natural experimentation brings you there. And that's what's so empowering about games, or one of the things that's so empowering about games. And another aspect of it is, I kind of trace myself, um, games, oftentimes people play games, they find these methods, and they put more value because they discover their right. methods. And they weren't taught that method. And that's, that ties into your educate without teaching. Well, and it's really good, right? Uh, the comment was basically, I'm an information scientist more than a game designer. And we talk about uh, this within the field of education all the time, even when we're not talking about games. And it's a really good point that, I mean, think about how we naturally learn, right? Look at any mammal in existence, and they learn through play, right? Look at lions in the savannah, and you'll see them play. Look at the dog when you first get it. And that's how it figures out how to do stuff. And this is the natural method. And more than that, rather than establish this fear of failure that we often establish in, uh, in the classroom by giving you a test and saying you must get this right on the first try, or giving you a homework and saying, if you don't get this right, your grade's going to go down. Mom and dad are going to be angry. Instead, in games, what we do is we let you have an iterative learning cycle, right? You try something, you fail, you immediately get back up and try again. I see this all the time. I, when testing FPSs, 
uh, especially with younger kids, I see this pattern where they'll run to a room, try and blast everybody in the room, and they'll die, right? <laughs> because we all know that, at least today, that's not how, how you win games. And even back in the day, you would just actually walk in a circle to do this. Um, but uh, today, right, after doing this two or three times, they'll run into the room, and then either accidentally or on purpose, they'll realize, oh, I should take cover. And they'll sit behind something, and then they'll be able to beat that room. And then every room after that, the first thing they do is look for cover. Because they've learned it. They've learned it themselves. They weren't told it. They figured it out because they had that quick iteration cycle where they could get immediate feedback, right? They could, and this is something that games can do that we have a hard time doing in the classroom. But they give you that immediate feedback. You know when you did something wrong in a game. Uh, <laughs> and through that, it allows you to learn. Uh, but yeah, other comments or questions? Back there. So uh, a while back when you showed the magic card, uh, you mentioned how we might be a you, like the fact that you said you learned something from a game, you know, might have been left word in the end. That, that's kind of weird. Um, it was it was mentioned a while back that uh, one of the possible reasons that games are so hard to take seriously is because the term uh, video game has the word game in it in, instead of something that sounds a little bit more professional. Uh, what, what are your what are your thoughts on this? Do we need rebranding? That's basically the question. The question is, uh, do we not take games seriously because they're called games? Well, work for the comic book industry, right? Uh, <laughs> but do we have to, I actually don't know the answer to this. It's a really good question. I hear debate back and forth all the time. Uh, do we take back that term and demonstrate that no, this medium is valid? Or do we go the graphic novel route and start all playing interactive experiences? Um, <laughs> and guess what? The cool thing about standing up here in front of you guys right now is I can say, you get to figure this out. <laughs> You're uh, I saw a hand somewhere up here. Oh, yeah. sure, go for it. Uh, so I, while I agree a lot with what you were saying about um, games showing people uh, ways that they can teach themselves, where they, ways they can develop new uh, paths of thinking for themselves, I... I'm sort of wondering about some of the examples that you picked, particularly you mentioned Civilization and Assassin's Creed, which, while they have lots of like interesting thinking that they provide, there's a lot of historical inaccuracies or very specific ways of thinking about the world, and so they seem kind of risky examples to me. And in that, do you think that we should maybe be trying to establish a higher standard of historical accuracy within these games that purport to be historically accurate simulations? So. Uh, I would say that the ending part of that statement is false, right? None of these things purport to be historically accurate simulations, and I think that's the essential part. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is a really good one, right? Through playing Civilization, through playing Assassin's Creed, if you take them as literally true, you will get a ton of misconceptions, right? Gandhi actually didn't nuke that many people. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, great question. Do you guys all know the story on why Gandhi yeah. didn't nuke yeah. Good, good. Um, for programmers out there, this, this is one of those things to watch out for. Um, so, anyway, uh, the, the issue is, when dealing with history, I think, and this is a personal perspective on history, I think the numbers and dates, if you watch Extra History, I try not to actually give that many numbers. Yeah. I try to only give the proper nouns that people will need to know in the classroom anyway, but I'd like to cut most of them. Because I don't think history is about dates. I don't think it's about names. I don't even think it's about historical accuracy. I think it's about understanding the problems they were wrestling with in the period, getting a feel for the period, and thinking about our own period through the lens of what that teaches you, right? And some of these things are uh, totally, or how about this? I will put it this way. This is a better example. Rome Total War, right? Okay. Uh, in the original Rome Total War, there was this horrible moment. There was this horrible moment where uh, artillery was OP. Back then, Roman artillery did not actually like take down massive numbers of troops. You weren't on a battlefield using your catapult on the guys charging you. Uh, and if you just play through the systems of the game, because of the way we've built those game systems, those people accidentally taught the wrong thing. But this comes into the other part of it. When I say this, I also don't think the educator will ever be removed. I don't think we can remove the teacher from the equation. Uh, and I think we need a new term there too, but I don't think, and because it can be the parent too, right? It's just whoever else is in the room. But I think that moment, that moment actually allows me an access point 
to have the discussion which uh, allows me to make it, make them think about that problem, think about these things, and have a different understanding of that historical period. So I'm not as worried about the inaccuracies because I think we, we need somebody we don't want to say games are going to solve education. Problems. And actually, it's true. If I shorthand it, if that sort of anybody got, I don't mean to say that at all. Because that's, you're absolutely right. That is totally incorrect. Um, but I don't think we need to worry about historical accuracy so long as we have somebody who has some historical knowledge there. As much as we need to worry about wrestle with the problems of this period of history or understand how some of this period of history works so you better understand today. Does that make sense? Uh, and along those lines, I know somebody who is teaching an ethics course. He's famous in Norway for teaching an ethics course uh, through using The Walking Dead. Oh. And you need the teacher in the room, right? Because we, well, none of us really had an ethics course when we played The Walking Dead. Um, <laughs> but kids are sitting there and they're reading their Hume or their Kant or their Nietzsche or whatever, right? And then instead of just reading this material and then going on to the next thing, they play the game. And then when these moral choices come up, they use that, they, they talk about how you can use that analytic provided in these books to deal with how you address with this real world problem. And who cares if I'm never actually going to have to confront zombies in my real life, right? Uh, but you're absolutely right. We have to worry about that in cases where uh, we are purporting to be historically accurate and we have no one to correct us. Um, and so yes, it is also all of your responsibility to do all this better too. Um, <laughs> absolutely. In the back over there. Hi, um, well, if you want to put keyboard command of, um, so I was just curious, um, what did you really like from like the game to game fest this year? And is there anything that you'd like to see improve upon for like next year? Yes. Uh, this pretty much puts me on the spot. Oh, um, <laughs> so real quick, do I still have time? I, I, no, I'm. No, you have no more time. All right, I'm out. <laughs> See you. <laughs> so I will answer this. I'll answer a couple more. Um, but uh, as far as Game Fest, the thing I would like to see done more is actually better theming, because a lot of a lot of the games I saw the play was sort of divorced from the theme, and there was a lot of times where there were some of these games that were close to having a powerful message, and they didn't find, quite find them right. And that's what we're struggling with as an industry as a whole. And so again, this is, this is one of those things I feel like we, we need to work on, and we need people who are coming into this industry, you guys, to uh, be thinking about and be prepared to do in our larger games. Um, as far as what I liked about Game Fest, like, uh, this would have never happened 10 years, well, I guess it did technically happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me go rewrite that one. Um, so, in, in 2000, uh, uh, it's not that long ago that you could never have done this, right? It's not too long ago that you've never had a group of people who are young and passionate and experimenting with all sorts of things. I saw some really great experiments. I saw ideas <coughs> that would never get greenlit in a AAA environment, but because you were here, because you were working on your own, because you were working in an academic environment, because the price of failure is at worst a bad grade, I saw some real experimentation, people trying something really new. And the the boldness, the bravery to do that, I think, is my is the favorite thing of mine so far about Game Fest. Uh, but yeah, a couple other questions back there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when you're showing like pictures of um, the, the ads and stuff of the women dressed like that and stuff like that, with like the gaming industry mostly being um, at the time, especially back in the day, but still mostly so with um, mostly. Um, uh, male-oriented business um, and stuff like that. Um, women do play, I mean, too, but not as many versus males. But um, what do you say for, um, because of the whole themes of like saving princesses and women being weak in the video games and stuff like that, what, do you, what are your thoughts on um, fixing that in a sense of having it uh, equal status of uh, not demoralizing women and having women not making women look like men either, but and demoralizing men either, but to have it on an equal status of male and men, m men and women, um, where women would most play the games too, I guess. Too. So the question was, how do we get more equality, gender equality in games? Uh, and before I answer that, I want to just address one misconception. Uh, it was said that there are not as many women who play games as men. This is actually statistically false. 
The only thing is that we, when we say games, we often are talking about is the AAA games industry. If you include things like Pop Cap, like Big Fish, actually women outnumber men and actually outpurchase men once you start including in app purchases in iPhone and mobile and in social games. Um, so women are as large a portion of the industry. We just decide to uh, <coughs> tactfully cut out the various games and say, oh, there are games that can't. That has to change, right? That's one of the pieces that has to change. But the other part is simply uh, getting more women involved in the industry, right? I'm super happy to see a number of women making games, yeah. playing <laughs> Uh, all right, other questions. I'm going to try and blaze through as many. Oh my god, we have so many left. I'm never going to get through all of these. All right, go for it. Hi. Um, you brought uh, The Walking Dead, and uh, that reminded me of games, specific games that have a distinct moral choice, and it's designed so that you have to live with the repercussions of that decision. But I know people that make, like, two save files so that they can explore all the ways. And the other example I want to quickly bring up is, like, Smash Brothers. Like, Super Smash Brothers Melee was about the really so that the competitive play ended up manipulating the business system in a way that wasn't concerned by the developer. My question is, does the developer have the right to have, have the right to say that there's a right and wrong way to play a game, even if it turns out to be something totally different? So first off, I have to give you credit for the most awesome segue I have ever gotten in a question. <laughs> <laughs> so moral choice gives the walking dead, by the way, Smash Bros. <laughs> So the question was, do you have, as a developer, the right to say that to your player that there's a right and wrong way to uh, play your game? Th this is a question for each of you individually. Personally, I do not believe in authorial intent, either in my work or in books or in films, right? It, and in games. What you get from it is what you get from it. And we'll all have different experiences with it, and you'll bring different things to it. And so I don't care if you got my vision of it, right? So long as you got something. Uh, and so to me, I don't personally think that there is a right way to play a game in the same way there's no right way to see a movie or read a book. Um, but this is something you all have to decide for yourselves. And that's really the best answer I can give. But all right, let's keep going. I'll try and get through as many as I can. Uh, yes? How do we make the living? Oh, how do you make it living from an engaging experience that you created today? Uh, depends. Is it a game where you like got a dance routine or like what's going on? Um, because uh, so anyway, game. Uh, how do you get a living from an experience that you've created? Really, the hard part is uh, it's a little bit of luck, but it's not anywhere near as much luck as you think. You just have to do all the other roles. Creating a game is not enough. You need to be doing all the PR, you need to be doing the marketing, you need to be doing the business development. You gotta go out there and get a distribution, right? You gotta go make sure that Kotaku and Destructoid and, and Giant Bomb are all listening to you and posting your thing, right? You've gotta make sure that people are, that you're engaged with your community on Facebook and on Twitter. You've gotta do all these other things. Wear all the other hats. Do your accounting. Make sure your monetization model is right. Uh, in order to make a living off an engaging experience, not only has to be an engaging experience, but you have to make sure that it gets to people and that you have the right uh, sort of presence out there that it can reach anyone it will resonate with. That's, that's the struggle because as, if you want to be an indie, you got to do a lot more than making a game. All right, right there. Yeah? So when I was growing up uh, in 19-whatever. Um, right. <laughs> I'll say this, I'll try to be quick. When I, had to, when I had to start playing video games, what required me and my friends to play Command and Conquer multiplayer was learning how to modify an audience at bat, oh, yeah. looking up a null modem, sitting there running a wire across the house, and then we got to play just me and him. <laughs> now, and then that created a stereotype where me and my friend were the smart kids. Like, we know stuff. Oh my god. But the new generation, that same older generation says, oh, but we're so smart. Look at her. She killed the iPad. But it doesn't require, what I'm saying is, we're so accessible now that it is. It, but we still think that that's brilliant, even though it doesn't require much mind work to make it happen. Are we overemphasizing these technologies now compared to what it was then? It's a really interesting question because I actually remember mine. It was Warhammer Shadow of the Horned Rat. And I had this old 386 that couldn't conceivably run Windows 95. And I had to get it. It was a Windows 95 game. It was the first only Windows 95 game that I had seen. And I had to get Windows 95 onto this machine that was way lower than the system spec. So I had to do all this ripping out. 
That was what taught me, right? Uh, and I think there's value there. On the other hand, there is value to being what they call digital native, right? Being adaptable to this technology. Uh, and <coughs> having, having a three-year-old or a two-year-old that can already understand and use a touch screen, there is some value to that. But the counter example I would actually give is Minecraft, right? Because I know a lot of kids who, I mean, my nephew's like nine, and he actually understands the basics of programming pretty solidly because of having to build stuff in Minecraft. And so in some ways, we are, we're losing some of that, but in other ways, with a lot of the customization, with a lot of these other uh, parts to games, we're also enabling that. Uh, so that's not an answer to your question, but it's the best you're gonna get from me, so <laughs> what I can do. All right, can you get that one? One more. Oh, one more? Oh, I just did the two over there, let me see. Let me see. You. So I've actually struggled um, with the at the administrative level, but actually not because not as often because they're afraid of games per se. But the answer I get is, "Oh, all that stuff sounds great. Uh, show us the metrics that it works, and we're happy to implement it, right?" But I can't get those metrics until we can actually implement it. Um, have you you know Quest to Learn? Uh, Quest to Learn is what was this? Yeah. Uh, so there's a, there's a public school in New York called Quest to Learn where it's entirely both game development and gameplay based education. It's a start, right? Uh, there's a school in Brazil called Oi Futuro Navi, which is actually much further along doing the same thing. Uh, they're rare right now, but as soon as we start getting the data, as soon as I think we have the data to back up that there's value, then I think these conversations will be much easier. I wish I had a better answer. Uh, all right, it looks like I have to get off this stage, but thank you everybody. <laughs>